We'll now have a talk uh, about the Poseidon Pipeline for Ocean Features Detection with Sentinel-2 by Emmanuel Castanho and André Giusti from the Air Center. Emmanuel holds a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from the University of Beira Interior in Portugal. Currently, he works at the EO Lab from the Air Center as a project developer in projects of national and European scope. His specialization is Earth Observation Data Applications across open science domains, with a special focus on advanced machine learning techniques applied to satellite optical data to detect marine pollution. He is also involved in operation phases of new satellite missions, including use case definition according to stakeholder needs. Andrea is a project developer in the Air Center, supporting the execution of technical activities of the Earth Observation Lab related to the analysis of remote sensing data, design of geospatial workflows, including results dissemination and outreach activities. He holds a master's degree in environmental engineering from the University of Bologna, and previously he uh, collaborated within the United Nations Satellite Center as a geographic information systems analyst. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, <clears throat> thank you to everybody. Um, so today's session, uh, me and Emmanuel, uh, we will give you a presentation about Poseidon, which is a tool that we have been working uh, in the last year, let's say, and is that is a pipeline for the detection of ocean feature, features uh, with satellite air observation, and in particular um, with, uh, with Sentinel-2 data. Uh, so, um, as you may know, many features are present on the ocean surface, and especially the one that can be observed by satellite. Uh, today presentation, um, we are going to focus on the problem of marine pollution, and more specifically, um, on what can be called in a larger way as uh, marine debris. I think we are all familiar kind of with what we are talking about. <clears throat> so marine debris is basically, uh, let's say, an umbrella term that uh, includes, um, let's say, an enduring manufactured uh, process solid material that is discarded, disposed, and then uh, abandoned and can end up in the marine environment or in coastal uh, in coastal environment as well, of course. Uh, so as you can see, um, plastic is of course included into this uh, large term. Um, and as it represents uh, nowadays uh, one of our greatest pollution problem, uh, we decided to try and develop something uh, that could be uh, helpful for, uh, uh, for this cause. And was one of our, uh, let's say, motivation for, for uh, developing this tool. Um, so, uh, in addition to common plastic items, um, it's also quite typical to come across other types of plastic in this kind of, uh, let's say, bunch of material called marine debris, such as fishing gears, rope, nets, and, and wood, and many, many more. And because of this complex and diverse um, nature of, of the problem, um, <clears throat> and different, like, somehow, shapes and sizes that this material can appear on the ocean surface. Um, for example, it can appear in large accumulation. Um, somehow like this, um, this can uh, create like a, a threat, not only to the environment, but only to the, only, uh, also to the navigational system um, uh, and safety, to the economy, uh, and of course to the human health. Um, so there are different ways that uh, how it can interact it can enter in the ocean, uh, can be from different sources and from, for different reasons. For example, uh, it can enter the ocean in the aftermath of uh, huge flooding events and catastrophes. Um, for example, in the aftermath of a hurricane landfall here, we uh, picture the example of, of Acapulco, uh, Hurricane Otis that struck uh, 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 Mexico coast on October uh, last year. Uh, and like as you can see, many material was transported by the by the floods uh, to the to the ocean and then washed uh, ashore. But also um, other type of way that can enter in the ocean, like for example, uh, spillage uh, from um, uh, say vessel that like uh, somehow lose like uh, 
uh, containers or material they are transporting. And this is an example that happened in Spain exactly uh, a month ago and create a big, of course, uh, environmental emergency and issue in the coast of, of Galicia and uh, so north of Spain. So uh, for the motivation for working on this issue and developing our tool is that Sentinel-2 has been proven by recent studies, both in uh, real, case, um, real cases, but also in control experiments to have a really great potential uh, to detect accumulation of floating marine debris even though uh, it originally was not a uh, uh, sensor like satellite uh, designed specifically for ocean application. And uh, the reason why, um, let's say, has a great potential is because, of course, it's free of charge. Uh, it provide, provides a good trade between spatial resolution with bands having from uh, 10, 20, and 60 meters of ground sampling distance and revisit frequency of uh, up to five days for most of the coastal waters. Um, has, of course, a kind of global coverage, as, we, as I said, like in coastal waters. And the multispectral instrument, um, it covers wavelengths of visible uh, short wave uh, infrared, but especially in the near infrared, um, which is particularly uh, helpful and suitable for detecting and differentiating small uh, floating objects on the, on the ocean surface. Of course, like, um, uh, let's say this technology is still like uh, in an early phase of uh, an evolution uh, for, such a, for such a purpose, it holds a, a lot of promises. That's because satellite um, can somehow keep an eye on, on much bigger areas, uh, even like those areas that are really hard to, to reach, so off the coast, for example, and especially the ones that are not reachable by, by on-site observation. Um, it helps to fill the gaps, as I said, also where we don't have so many on-site observation, gives us a constant, regular and long-term data, uh, which helps to manage and foster somehow cleaning, um, clean up activities of marine debris. Um, it supports effective monitoring, of course, for management and remediation policies, and is a cost-effective cost and replicable solution. Uh, so, um, so how, let's say, uh, marine debris, it looks in, in, in pictures, so in satellite picture and Sentinel-2 pictures. Well, as you can see um, in this example in the Gulf of Honduras, um, so the marine debris pixels are appearing as a very, uh, a very bright uh, features. In this case, it's a filament that uh, was spotted off the coast of Honduras after, in the aftermath of, uh, of uh, the transport of a large amount of debris uh, from, from Honduras and that originated in Guatemala and that was spotted like uh, kind of uh, yeah, near the coast of Honduras in this case and near to an archipelago which is, which is near to the coast. But also as you can see here in a in the top picture, uh, satellite, um, these satellite images mm, that uh, were taken from controlled uh, experiments where they deployed uh, some plastic targets on the, on the, on the, on the on sea and they acquired some satellite images. Also here, as you can see in the top uh, right picture, you can see um, that this, uh, this material appears as a bright is a bright feature. But uh, as you can imagine, um, <clears throat> as you and you have illustrated here, um, so it, this is not the only bright and especially not the only floating material that appears on the ocean surface. Uh, so here we have some natural uh, some example of natural origin, um, such as macro and uh, microalgae, cyanobacteria, is not uh, jellyfishes and sea pumice that can can originate from underwater uh, volcanic eruption. Also not such a common thing, maybe uh, shrimps, eggs, and, and, and tree pollen. Uh, but also, um, um, so you have here like pictures, some, some other things that it's possible to see, which maybe is more common, of course, water, <laughs> uh, but uh, also rich sediment, rich water, vessels, offshore structures, and all the features that 
also um, are related to um, to the ocean surface and are always there. And as you might saw today, the the, the waves here are creating a lot of white caps uh, and and sea foam sometimes that it for us like is creating a bit of challenges, especially in the in the differentiation between marine debris and, and these kind of features. Of course, we have clouds, of course, they are not floating, but they are always there. Um, so um, as you could see, uh, there are several types of objects that uh, to take into account in the detection of ocean feature features using satellite. Uh, fortunately, uh, there are some really nice initiatives. Uh, this one is called uh, Marida, Marine Debris archive that uh, has overcome some of the, the challenges that we, we are facing uh, in, this, uh, in, this in our objective. So this is a spectral library data set that with annotation derived from a verified debris event together with several other ocean features in multispectral data collected by, uh, by Sentinel-2. Um, the annotations are around uh, 800,000 and are divided in 15 classes that range from plastic, um, natural organic material, vessels, uh, the wakes of the vessels, foam, um, clouds, but also different type of waters because it's not just clear water, but uh, turbid water, sediment laden water and shallow water. Um, so yes, so thanks to this uh, uh, open access data set was another uh, great motivation for us to develop such a tool. Um, and this data set allows us to explore the spectral behavior of uh, the specific uh, floating materials. Uh, and yeah, was uh, one of the things that driven us to, um, to create a remote sensing and machine learning pipeline, uh, such as uh, Poseidon. Um, so, uh, to the, so to the determine the, the, the different type of object, uh, present in the image, and uh, the, and finally to to obtain our final results, so to to classify it, uh, we use different this different uh, spectral signature uh, give, provided by Marid, but also some that we extracted ourselves, um, and we use to compare the reflectances of object in a subtle image um, to the spectral profiles of material that we uh, we already know. For example, here you have uh, some explanation about how it is it's possible to see. Uh, the difference uh, between ocean water, floating plastic, and vegetation, especially in the uh, near infrared part, um, while the water has a pretty low reflectance, the floating plastic has a high reflectance but have a, still a flat spectrum. And um, instead, like in this case, is dense sargassum has a very high reflectance in the in the in the near infrared. Um, so and. Let's say to achieve uh, finally an automated, efficient, and systematic classification, providing a high accuracy in satellite imagery, uh, we utilized uh, machine learning techniques and using a big data set as, uh, as Marida. And these techniques uh, are commonly employed in addressing uh, such a complex uh, and somehow difficult task of classifying. Uh, ocean feature with a good accuracy or high accuracy, and considering that Sentinel-2 has, a, has a, well, 13 bands, we are actually using in our processing only in the end 11, but still is a lot of, uh, is a lot of information. Uh, and so uh, machine, machine learning like helps us to, to finally obtain, uh, a, let's say, a trained model that we can use and apply to then classify uh, a satellite image. Um, so here I will, uh, so this is our uh, tool, it's available on GitHub and you're really free to, uh, uh, to visit our page and uh, um, clone, clone our code and, 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 try, and try it out. Uh, so well, uh, I, meant, I didn't mention this our, our pipeline is all written uh, currently in Python, <laughs> but uh, as Manuel later we will we'll explain, we also integrate some steps uh, at the moment in Julia and hopefully we will uh, keep improving um, this part. 
So the uh, another motivation that driven us to to let's say uh, to to um, to make this available is that available to everyone is open source is that uh, nowadays uh, at our knowledge uh, automatic data pipeline with such a purpose uh, we're not still we're still like rare uh, in literature um, uh, and yeah so we make it open to everybody and so that let's say uh, we could uh, foster uh, the development of an operational tool for long-term monitoring of marine plastic uh, in the ocean, but also other kind of um, features, as we, we I explained before. So, just to give you uh, an overview, uh, uh, what what actually is so the pipeline. Um, the first part, let's say, is the acquisition of the Sentinel-2 data. That is done by defining a region of interest and the sensing period. And of course, uh, it's needed also to have some credential to access uh, the API services that we are using uh, to download the data. In uh, the beginning, we were using Sentinel SAT uh, package and downloading the, uh, the image from the Copernicus Open Access app, but nowadays not more used. And sometimes it was a bit difficult to download uh, long term archive um, data. Uh, so we decided to go for the Google Cloud uh, repository where like the, the, the Sentinel-2 uh, data are all available. Maybe they are not like ready available, uh, let's say, the, the next day, but it takes a bit longer, but it's, it's quite good, let's say, way of downloading the data. Uh, but we now, now we are actually using the most is the Copernicus data ecosystem, the space ecosystem, uh, to download the data because the as well. So, uh, was explained, uh, I think, no, um, is nowadays what is mainly used, let's say. Uh, so the first uh, step of the pre-processing before applying uh, the classification is the atmospheric correction. Uh, so uh, we download, actually, as didn't say, we download in Sentinel-2 level 1C data, uh, that is top of atmosphere data, uh, so top of atmosphere reflectances, and we want to uh, remove, in this case, the Rayleigh uh, scattering. So we obtain like uh, an atmospheric corrected uh, image um, of the of the bands, and we are doing this. We implemented this by uh, by using Acolyte package. Uh, there are several others, but in this case, uh, we were, um, for example, it's possible to use also Send to Core. Uh, but uh, we decided to use Acolyte because uh, the, the data set Marida that I showed before is also uh, using the same. And we wanted to have somehow uh, the same kind of, of course, uh, uh, reflectances somehow. Uh, then there is a part like that allows to uh, uh, create the land and water masking. Uh, the, the land masking is made, of course, because we are not interested in, in classifying any pixel uh, which is on land, on the coast, and we are creating the water mask using the ESA World Cover 2021. There's also an option for uh, uh, removing uh, pure water pixels, uh, depending on, let's say, a uh, specified threshold by the user. Um, and this can be done uh, in two methods. One is by thresholding the band eight, and the other way is like by thresholding the normalized different water index D and DWI. Uh, we also have an additional uh, masking uh, part in our pipeline, which allows to remove the clouds using S2 Cloudless, which is the, actually a method which is also used by Sentinel Hub um, uh, in their platform, the one online, and allows yes to, to remove uh, clouds. And even though our, our model is actually, our pipeline and model are classifying also clouds since they are included into this Merida uh, data set, we decide to add also uh, this additional option. Uh, so finally, once the, 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 the satellite imagery are, are let's say, uh, pre-processed, uh, we can split it and then finally mosaic, and then we apply a machine learning algorithm and models uh, to finally have a classified image. The pipeline currently supports um, so uh, random forest and XGBoost models. Um, so, 
decision tree models, but also uh, we added an option to, to, uh, to use pre-trained UNET models, so neural networks, and um, then Emmanuel uh, will, uh, will give you a bit of a, a demo and overview about the use of one of these of this models for the classification. So, uh, well, I give the floor to my colleague now that will speak a bit more about the models, the one that we were working on, and, and give you a bit of uh, demonstration about the tool. Thank you, Andrea. Hello, everyone. So we tried a lot of machine learning models from Random Forest, XGBoost, uh, UNET, and uh, we also expand the uh, library, the spectral uh, signatures library, and we tested also on different uh, places on, on the worldwide. Uh, and uh, one of the classes that we used to expand this uh, spectral library was the phytoplankton uh, blooms. Um, we found uh, quite a lot of uh, challenges, is, uh, especially when we are facing uh, plastics and uh, f uh, the contrast with plastics, foams, clouds, and ships, and it can uh, appear a lot of uh, false detections uh, uh, sometimes. And uh, here, for example, you can check the scores uh, the, uh, the, um, for uh, two models that we trained, and okay, they present a good score on the test data set, but then when they go to the real world, it's a completely different uh, situation. Uh, the integration of uh, Julia uh, into uh, Python was from the, a collaboration from last um, year, uh, Julia Yo, thank you to Alexander, uh, that used uh, the Flux package to train uh, and uh, also develop the architecture of uh, this uh, UNET. And then uh, at the Air Center, we um, integrated this uh, uh, Julia uh, developed uh, UNET model uh, using the Julia call, uh, Python call, which is uh, really easy to integrate. And we, we have all explained the steps on our, um, uh, on our GitHub. Um, and what was the main motivation behind this? Uh, the, uh, well, uh, first to give more options to the user. Well, maybe the user likes to develop their uh, machine learning models on Julia. Okay, put then this on Poseidon. So it gives the, the user more options, but also the Julia processing uh, capabilities and the use of the GPU. Uh, two applications of the Poseidon are the post-disaster uh, management, is one of them. Uh, for example, after uh, flooding events, and here we tested on uh, the Honduras, on Honduras uh, to detect pixels of uh, the marine debris. And here you can see the, the small stars, they are, uh, uh, well, uh, clusters or of at least 10 marine debris pixels uh, that are on a distance of 100 uh, uh, meters. So this is a this was a big uh, flooding event. Honduras and uh, South Africa, as I will show you, is very well uh, propice to this kind of uh, events. So another application is for the long-term uh, seasonal uh, analysis. So we we created a kind of a separated uh, script for that, that we um, analyze uh, several years of the uh, same uh, area. Uh, for the marine debris, and then we uh, plot uh, everything to see where is the, the clusters, maybe possible areas of uh, aggregation that we can move, uh, uh, well, uh, the cleaning uh, missions to those kind of places. And then we also uh, compare this with the seasons, uh, like the uh, dryers and the uh, and, uh, uh, rainy season. Uh, so it's important uh, to know that for us to expand this uh, spectral uh, library, for example, the spectral library to train the models, we always need the in situ uh, validation. And in situ validation is a very hard thing uh, on this kind of uh, 
uh, it's a kind of a challenge and we go to the newspapers to the literature to find events but also we use uh, very high resolution uh, satellite images from uh, geosat since we have a, a partnership with them but uh, also uh, regarding the la plage with these land-based um, uh, solutions for plastics uh, it's a project the horizon 2020 project w w which we are involved we have the well, the, the good thing that we have this, uh, the ship from our partner Alcor, where uh, Andre was there and he, he was find, uh, able to find this uh, uh, bloom that uh, was interesting uh, uh, to analyze. So improvements since the last Julie AO, well, we were not uh, stopped, we were not sleeping about this uh, subject, we were working on this. <laughs> And uh, the first thing was the support for the new Copernicus data space ecosystem uh, for downloading the Sentinel-2 uh, products, which is working uh, quite good now. Uh, but it's still on my GitHub. I didn't push to, uh, push to the Air Center GitHub. I need to do that. Um, and uh, from uh, also the collaboration for this UNET uh, model uh, in Julia to improve the GPU classification speed. Um, and the inter uh, and this integration, but also a web app prototype uh, to show the Poseidon uh, result, and this can be also like um, a challenge for you uh, of how this uh, how Julia can facilitate this web development because this was well this was a prototype and this was created with Folium uh, from Python. And this has uh, some kind of limitations, especially on time sliders for several years. Uh, and, and when it goes to the mobile phone, it's, uh, ha it has a different behavior. So yeah, this is a thing that needs to be more explored. So the visualization and the, the analysis of the long-term uh, data with the density and occurrence maps, this was for a project uh, of uh, regional interest, the Echo Blue, where we did this analysis for the Terceira Island, but also for uh, other islands. And, uh, and with this long-term analysis, uh, we found that GeoTIFF uh, may not be the most efficient way to store this data, because, for example, for the maskings, it is, uh, well, occupying a, a storage of 300 gigabytes. So this is, maybe we need to find an alternative for this, like uh, the NetCDF or even uh, different formats. Uh, and we trained, of course, new models and expanded the spectral library. For, so, yeah, I still have time. So for the, I have a small hands-on session. It's really simple and I will only show the, um, how the results look like that come from Poseidon. And the study case that I will use uh, is this uh, G uh, discharge uh, event uh, at the sea on, on, in so South Africa uh, from, well, two years ago, yeah. We are on 24 already. So uh, as you can see, there is a lot of garbage and uh, how can you take a sun bath on this condition? So it's important to move uh, cleaning efforts to this kind of uh, places and uh, Poseidon can help with that. So since Poseidon is quite big, the workflow is quite big, I will focus only on a small portion, like it will be the random forest uh, and the visualization of uh, this data. Uh, for this, I will use Docker and also I will explain a bit where the data com comes from. F uh, so for example, uh, everyone has a different machine. I have a Mac, someone ha may, might have a Windows, another one call it Linux. So everyone might be a different, have a different thing. So Docker allows to have um, a common environment to test this notebook without problems. Uh, the data, the Merida Random Forest uh, model, it's a pre-trained model that we trained like uh, some time ago with uh, a recall of 91%. Um, and this stack of data includes the 11 uh, Sentinel-2 after atmospheric correction and eight uh, spectral uh, indices. So uh, let's go. Okay. 
So I don't know if someone tried to do the setup. I sent some instructions. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time, but um, I can also give uh, answer some questions if you have later. But the no notebook is this one. It's here on the Julia 24. It's inside the notebooks. And then it's this Poseidon results uh, demo. And here, <clears throat> You have a preview, a preview of the final, uh, what you will be able to see at the end. And also there are two ways of doing this setup. The one of the Docker, which I recommend. And uh, if you have already Anaconda installed on your uh, computer, you can use this uh, here on the bottom. So you have two ways of doing this setup. For the Docker, you only need to go to the Docker website, download Docker, you don't need the registration. Uh, after installation, uh, uh, well, you just go to, you, you need to, do f to make the clone of the repository and you open a terminal inside uh, this notebook that I will analyze uh, right now, a PowerShell on Windows. And you just type this uh, Docker build T Poseidon results demo dot and then this other command here. Uh, and this will uh, start a Jupyter. You also need to go to the OneDrive to do the download of the um, data set. The data set is 200 megabytes, I think, approximately. So it's uh, a, a bit heavy. Uh, again, this GeoTIFF uh, thing, maybe with another format will be better. So I don't know if someone installed, if someone has a question, can make now, uh, some difficulties installing this. If not, I will so continue here on the Jupyter uh, notebook. So uh, here I just do the import of uh, some libraries. I uh, want to give here some uh, focus on the leaf map which is the one that we will use to um, show the results. Uh, and oh yeah, and after you install the, um, the, the Docker and you set up the Jupyter, it, it will look like this. So the data will be inside here if you downloaded the data and replaced. And uh, then you just put the path for the data we read the data and here you can see that it has the 11 um, bands and also the some spectral index indices like the NDVI, which is good to enhance the floating vegetation at the surface of the ocean. For example, to differentiate um, macroalgae. And then uh, here is just in initiating uh, the leaf map, the map of in a certain uh, location. In this case, it's the, the location for the South Africa. And uh, here I add to this map a RGB layer, uh, a NDWI layer, and the FDI layer. I select the color maps uh, for this. Uh, you can also add a cell with M to see the status of the layers that are being added on the map, but I will do this, the visualization, only at the end. So for the random uh, forest, uh, for the machine learning uh, training, uh, I transformed uh, all this stack into data frame. So this is mainly what is represented here. It's uh, the machine learning features will be the bands and the indices. And uh, the rows is like the values uh, for, in the case of the bands are the reflectances of the pixels extracted. Since the machine learning was, well, the, he, in here is to analyze the, the data. Uh, so if we have the stack that came, comes out from Poseidon and we want to apply this pre-trained model on that stack, in this case, transformed to data frame, it is transformed to data frame, to see where is the point of uh, marine debris, where is the marine debris classification. Yeah, and the classification is done here. Uh, I also um, 
uh, need to remove the not the numbers, uh, but at the same time I need to save this uh, a structure of the data frame so I that I don't lose uh, geolocation, and. Uh, I use this uh, command here at the beginning because on the Jupyter notebook it gives a, a strange bug, broken pipe bug. It, this doesn't work. Uh, this doesn't uh, show on a normal script, but in Jupyter it shows up. And then uh, I just okay. I add this uh, the classification after the it does the classification. I add this to the map with some, uh, this is the colors, like for example, marine debris is uh, the one and the, it will be in uh, red. So this comes from Mar Marida, the Marida data set that Andrea presented. So the, the color status, it's all over there. And to also plot some points, some uh, cent of the, uh, the pixel center coordinates, I convert the geotiff to X, Y, and Z but this is a very heavy file, so I convert it to a feather, which is more lighter. Uh, probably there is a, a easy way to do this that doesn't need like uh, converting the file and then saving on the machine and then converting again to the other one. And here is o uh, only a, a function that do, does this uh, uh, CRS, uh, the conversion from the Sentinel-2 uh, Sentinel to the uh, 4326. And uh, to show, we only use the, the marine debris uh, because it's the ones that matter uh, to us. Yeah, after that, we can just add this to the map and the map will show like this. So this is the, in South Africa, you can see here, it's quite a, uh, yeah, but with this internet is uh, quite hard. So it's supposed to show the, the base map behind. Uh, but this is the, the tile that we are analyzing and you can see here some uh, patches, some agglomerations of some kind of material and after running this uh, classification, it detects, well, some points that it thinks it's marine debris. Uh, there are also uh, the other, other layers that we had. So this, this one is the RGB, but then there is the NDWI. And NDWI is uh, quite good to find some uh, filaments that can be at the surface uh, of the ocean. And also the FDI, which is the Floating Debris uh, Index by Mir Biermann. Uh, at all, it's, uh, it's it's good for this kind of detections too, but uh, it can have some kind of a confusion uh, with uh, the clouds, for example, because you can see the filament has uh, high values, but also the clouds in here has high values. So this the confusion between the the marine debris uh, plastics. Well, when I see marine debris here, is the definition? Well, it's here on the top. I put here the definitions for all the classes, and the marine debris is the floating plastics or other polymers mixed anthropogenic uh, debris. Uh, and finally, the classification uh, layer. I can remove this one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and uh, there is two kinds of reds here. There is the bright red, which is the marine debris, but then there, there is this darker red, which is uh, natural organic material, like uh, wood. And uh, also we can see that it detects very well the clouds, but still uh, there are some uh, false, uh, yeah, let me just remove here, just to see the, how well it detects the clouds. Yeah, kind of detects well the clouds. And uh, there is here, uh, for example, a false detection, uh, which um, he considers this agglomeration over here is a ship, which doesn't make any sense. And, uh, but this is a thing that needs uh, more uh, improvements. Uh, yeah, so this was all I had to present it. I don't know, any questions?
Uh, I know it's way harder to make a data set for it, but have you considered using, again, uh, SAR data because it is possible to detect debris in SAR data? What is the resolution? Depending on what's well, depending on what SAR image you use, you can have uh, yeah, the free one, Sentinel fifth, one. Yeah, uh, twenty meters. Yeah, twenty meters. Uh, yeah, Sentinel two here, for example, the best one is uh, the ten meters uh, resolution. There are papers that use uh, SAR data for the detection of marine debris. Yeah, but uh, the mainly literature about this topic is uh, everything in Sentinel two based on the uh, the multi the spectra. Yeah. of the, the materi materials. But yes, also SAR data is a, a problem. But, but I mean, like the, the, I think the only real false positive you have for marine debris in SAR data would be sargassum or other similar uh, algae. Right. But algae mainly. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't have many bright features that looks like debris. Yeah, but the, I think it's correct. I think we need an approach to that because, um, well, uh, it's not just sargassum, but many other yeah. things, uh, especially um, so uh, in case of wind, uh, yeah. in the ocean, we can see out today from here, there's many white cups uh, or like foam, like in the, in the, the coastal areas, we have yeah. big difficulties in classifying and deciding if that is actually a good detection or not because the, 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 the foam that's creating from the breaking waves yeah that's like very bright and filament structure like thing and I maybe using uh, optical data we are a bit more like um, let's say more bands to play with yeah. why like certain data we have just single information and then we are like okay we just have one in the other case we have uh, 11 so that was the reason why so of course, like their data doesn't, yeah, does not problem with clouds. They're amazing, yeah, yeah, yeah. But definitely something that could be integrated. Yeah, yeah I, th I think there is a way to to do this with different uh, methodologies, but we can discuss uh, later. Um, when I look online on your data, it looks like it the 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 the, the labels are points. Uh, yeah, yeah, pixels. Ah, so it's like you you labeled this pixel as being debris, or yeah. did you? Because now it looks like there's actually like spatial structures. Did you do segmentation in the labels, or are the labels just points? No, the labels are like so uh, coordinates. Yeah, and then like uh, so it's extracting extracting like the spectral signatures. On uh, all 13 bands yeah. from that specific pixel, so it's annotated. So, okay, this pixel is we say is uh, well, marine debris or foam or ship, yeah. and then give you like so. It actually was not made by us, the subset. Maybe this not, but uh, yeah, the not made by us. We use a data set that is available. It was published in 2021, I think. So they they annotated pixels and then. Uh, the, the, but the they that, who, that could explain the ships. Yeah, they don't annotate pixel by pixel. They create areas okay. around, and then this extracts okay. the each pixel inside that area, the reflectance. They take the center of the pixel. <coughs> At least twice problem of big files. One of them was for masks. Sorry? You mentioned the twice problems about the size of the memory consumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the, with the masks and the X, Y, Z points. The masks, you probably are using floating points. If you use shards, you can go no smaller than that in any, does not depend on the format. Are you using? Yeah, yeah. no, no, it, I'm using, uh, we are not using the float, we are using the uint. But then the? It, it's not, uh, yeah, we are using int. Int, but yeah. what size of int? Uh, eight. eight. Eight bits, okay, you cannot go smaller than that. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, okay. The other thing, the other one about the same type is X, Y, Z. What I said in my comment is, I see many types people using floats 64, double precision. When well, you don't need that precision, uh, that size of type uh, at all. And if that, that doesn't make a difference when you have small numbers, but when you have large number of files, of files of, of, of uh, data sets, the, yeah, uh, but normally float 32, which cuts by half, it's uh, more than enough for the things. So if the uh, sentiment 2 comes in the float 32, so, Sorry? No. The, the, the sentiment 2 data we are using is in float 32. 32, so okay. Yeah. Uh, but would better have been. The problem is that uh, about space and, and data, data storage is that um, the way that at the beginning we were working was like input output and for every step uh, adding an input that was opening basically a, a TIFF file and then uh, save it back to TIFF and then opening again. Mm. And so uh, of course there is a lot of improvement we have to do especially for this, and this is something we want to do, of course. Uh, but yeah, the, our main issue is, the, is that, basically. Hello. Uh. I can shout. Uh, so my name is Guilherme Vaz, I'm for Blue Oasis, and we have been working with the ocean cleanup before, so you may know because it was the first company in the Netherlands that was cleaning the plastics. So one thing that can help you is that they have a lot of validation material, of course. So we, they know where are the plastics, not in general debris, but plastics. So I think once I made the contact with Pedro, with Ocean Cleanup, so if, if you are doing something, they are working on the same. So, if, but if you need like validation data where the plastics are, for instance, where they are working, okay. yeah. possibly okay. it's. Uh, uh, wait, wait. Let me oh, okay. let me tell this one. Uh, be, when I was uh, talking also with them on this uh, last event of Marine uh, Litter on Netherlands, they were saying that they are focusing on the Pacific. Yes, which is very far from the coast, right? And yes. Sentinel-2 doesn't reach okay. that area. Well, then, then it, you solve the problem. They, they, they use Lab data. So another thing is that, they, like them, we also did some work for them and together with them, they are advanced, but on uh, uh, tracking plastics using cameras, not the same as you are doing. So with drones and with cameras on fixed posts and fixed things, because the plastic and the sea comes from the rivers. They're not most of them. Yeah. Um, so, and for that we use, like the problems you are having, maybe, maybe you didn't face the problems. We are facing a lot of problems. Of course, the pre-processing is very important. So even more important than almost the machine learning algorithm. And so there's a lot of pre-processing we tried that we can tell you what we, we did, but it was for visual, not for uh, these kind of things. And we use YOLOs, YOLO kind of uh, uh, architectures that was much better than, but it was for our case with images from drones and from uh, um, cameras. So if you need to know something, Pedro has my, uh, our contacts. We're still working with the ocean cleanup, so somehow can be some link with them if you want. Uh, okay. It's a really good idea. And so when I joined a, um, a cruise ship like this last summer, uh, we also had a, with the partners an idea of putting like cameras uh, on, on the deck. Yeah. In order to, uh, instead of doing visual observation. Yeah. Uh, we are trying to do that with the fishermen in Ericeira. Yeah. So if you have cameras on decks of fishermen or other p people and you can detect the plastics, send the data back home and you know where the plastics are, then we have Lagrangian trackers to also check what the plastics are. I, yeah. Ocean Cleanup is working on that. We are trying to help a bit on that. But uh, so to tell that there is a link here also if you want to talk with us afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay.